incompleteness theorem, uh, if you could have a consistency proof of T, then you'd be able to derive the Gödel sentence. But we've already shown that you cannot derive the Gödel sentence. So you can't have a consistency proof. So the significance of the results, I think, uh, for mathematics alone and, and logic alone, what do we do about these results of Gödel's? Well, unlike the, the crisis in the foundations uh, in relation to the inconsistency that had been proven by Russell, that had to be fixed, right? You, you can't keep going with mathematics when it's inconsistent. I mean, amazingly, a great deal of mathematics, it was business as usual because it was a crisis in set theory. And insofar as you thought the rest of mathematics was just you know, set theory in sheep's clothing, then, you know, we're in trouble. But that's not to say that you can't continue working in mathematics. Uh, think of crises in other branches of science. You might have a crisis in quantum mechanics, as arguably we do at the moment. Interpretation of quantum mechanics is deeply problematic. Does that mean ecologists should shut up shop until quantum physicists get things sorted out? No. Business is usual in, in, in ecology and elsewhere. And so for mathematics, a lot of mathematics went by business as usual, but you know, there were beads of sweat on their brow, I think, for fair to say, for 20 or 30 years. Uh, so in, in, whereas the Gödel results, these are not kind of things that need to be fixed. These are just facts about the systems. This is just a fact about mathematics. It will have blind spots. You cannot derive the consistency of a system that's rich enough to have mathematics in it within the system. You cannot derive every truth of the system. There will be these blind spots. What are you going to do about it? Live with it. That's why it's such a sort of startling result. These are mathematical theorems about mathematics, or as we're often called now, metamathematical theorems, about sort of a layer, a, a, a layer above mathematics. And we just have to come to terms with them. So they're very, very important about, very, very important implications for all sorts of places, like you know, mathematics and logic, obviously, but also for computing. If you think about what a computer is, well, a computer is a kind of program machine to crank through a bunch of rules. Right? What can computers do? Well, insofar as the computer is an a, 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 a instantiation of a Gödel system, there'll be blind spots. Okay, so this led some people to think that okay, these results aren't just mathematical results now, then. They lead to important, important insights into nature of computation, nature of machine thinking, and you can feel it coming. Is there a difference between human thinking and machine thinking? So let me just run quickly through an argument that has got a lot of press, I think, and perhaps one of the reasons that Gödel's results are, uh, are as famous as they are, is the significance of these results, if any, for uh, understanding the human mind. So, Gödel, in effect, showed that there are blind spots in mathematics, unprovable truths. But the truth of the Gödel sentence, remember the Gödel sentence, this sentence is unprovable, the truth of that's plain to see. Everybody in the room can see that that's true. Right? It took us a couple of minutes to think our way through it, but it's clear that that sentence is, must be true. So there's a true sentence that's not derivable within mathematics. So it's a blind spot by any kind of algorithmic computational system like mathematics or like a machine, but we humans can see it plain as day. It's true. So it looks like, uh, and I'm not endorsing this line of thought, but it's a very natural line of thought, it looks like there's something fundamentally different, to, different between the way humans think about these things and the way the machines think. You know, not surprising, you might, you might suggest, but very, very popular view is that a human brain is just a kind of fancy computer made of you know, meat instead of silicon. That's all. You know, that it's just a fancy computer. And this line of thought suggests, well, no, it looks like there's something fundamentally different about 
machine thinking which has these girdled blind spots, if you like, whereas the very blind spots that have been demonstrated, at least, are not blind spots at all to a human. So does this tell us something deep and interesting about the difference between, say, computers and human minds? Uh, I, I don't think so, but it's a, it's a fascinating thought and it's worth sort of dwelling on, thinking about that for a moment, what the Gödel result really shows and whether that does tell us something different about humans and machines. Why, if I can just say briefly why I don't think it tells us anything terribly uh, important about the differences is, well, on one hand, it's utterly unsurprising that we're not working like a kind of machine that Gödel had in mind because, for a start, we use probabilistic reasoning. We use hunches. We use, it's plain to see. I don't need a proof that there are people in this room, despite you know, what various philosophers have said throughout history. Uh, <laughs> I don't need a proof of that. Why? Because I can just see it. I haven't got a... I haven't got a, a proof of that in terms of mathematical proof, it's just plain to see. Okay? And we humans use it's plain to see, probabilistic reasoning, hunches, gut feelings, all sorts of things in our reasoning. And to be quite honest, we don't always distinguish between these different kinds of reasoning. When you're doing something a little bit more rigorous, like in a, uh, a logic paper, which you rarely carry outside of the logic classroom, uh, when you're doing that sort of reasoning, elsewhere you might, you know, you read an editorial of a newspaper, for instance, there'll be a bit of deductive re reasoning, like you might see in a logic class, a bit of probabilistic, a bit of gut feeling, a bit of a whole bunch of stuff, and not distinguish, just all sort of mixed in. So in a way, it's not surprising that humans are not like machines. But that's not what the claim is. The claim is that they can't be, you know, if you tried to model a human mind like this, it, it, it just doesn't have the blind spot. So what is it about the human mind? It's almost mysterious, right? There's something mysterious about the human mind that it doesn't have the blind spots the machine has. Well, here's the kind of simple answer, I think. Firstly, it's not surprising because we, we, we're a complicated... If we're a computer at all, you know, that lump of meat is a complicated lump of meat and it does some extraordinary range of things and an extraordinary variety of reasoning that goes on all mish mishmashed together. Gödel's result just doesn't apply to such things. So not surprising that it doesn't have the blind spots at least. But here's a kind of more interesting answer, I think, is that what the Gödel result shows is that on the assumption that the system is consistent, there will be these blind spots. It doesn't say that there are blind spots, blind spots simpliciter, just that if the system is consistent, there will be blind spots. So when, you, when I said to you, but it's plain to see, right? The sentence is unprovable. Is plain to see, I said. What I actually smuggled in there with the plain to see was that and everything you believe is consistent. Your system is consistent. How plausible is that? Not at all, right? <laughs> we all have inconsistent beliefs about all sorts of things, right? I, I, I invite you to sort of think about your own belief systems. And I don't mean in sort of, uh, uh, um, you know, ways that you should be chastised for. All sorts of, you know, when you're in the logic classroom, you think such and such. When you step outside the logic classroom, you believe something slightly differently. Uh, we all have inconsistent beliefs about the city we live in, okay? I know my local neighbourhood, and I have a kind of mental map of that local neighbourhood, and I have a mental map of another neighbourhood nearby. Those maps overlap. Very, very common phenomenon is to think that, you know, such and such a street runs north-south, because it's roughly north-south, and then over here I'm thinking about that very same street, but not realising that it's the same street, thinking that it runs more or less east-west, for instance. These very, very common mistakes people make by having local maps of their city and they've got inconsistencies in the overlap of those maps. Utterly implausible that any of us have consistent beliefs. In fact, if you do, you know, come and talk to me later because you deserve a medal. You really do. <laughs> so what I did when I said it's plain to see was actually smuggle in a really, really heavy duty and false assumption that the system is consistent. Okay, that's just utterly implausible. And indeed, it's implausible for very good reasons for which Gödel pointed out to us. 
you cannot prove the consistency of the system. So in effect, what I've done is not just smuggled in the consistency of the system, but it's known to you that the system is consistent. You know no such thing. Gödel's second incompleteness theorem, in a way, ensures that that can't be the case. Still, it's an interesting thought, isn't it? <laughs> there is this fundamental difference between minds and machines. I'll finish off now with just, uh, just leaving the incompleteness stuff aside, and I just want to say a couple of things about... Uh, uh, one of the lesser-known results of Gödel, but I think it's one of my favourites, I just think it shows how quirky the guy was. So this is Gödel and Einstein, regular walking partners at, at uh, uh, Princeton in the 1950s. And no doubt over various conversations with Einstein, Gödel came up to speed. He was a smart guy, right? He didn't really work in mathematical physics, but he was a smart guy. And he came up to speed on general relativity. Came up to speed, actually a little bit more than up to speed. Came up to speed to the point where he could publish in the area and published a startling result. So he found that there was this really odd model of Einstein's equations. So Einstein's equations are the equations that describe the, the way space-time is, or the way it could be. The details are going to depend on the distribution of matter and the like, but these are the big global constraints, if you like, how space-time is structured. And what Gerl showed was that there were these really odd solutions that no one could have been looking for because they were looking for solutions for the most part that looked something like the universe we live in. And what Gödel found were these really kind of odd solutions, but basically a big rotating disk, a universe that's a big rotating disk. And he found that in such a universe, there were closed time-like world lines. Okay. What that means is a world line is just a sort of a trajectory of the particle through space-time. Okay. Closed means it comes back on itself. Right? World lines, you know, if you think about my world line, it sort of started in some place, I moved around in space, and as time went by, I moved. So I've got this kind of trajectory. What a closed time like world line looks like is a world line that comes back on itself in the, spa in the temporal dimension. In a word, time travel. It's a kind of time travel. If, if space time has the right kind of structure, and you're cunning enough to sort of shoot a rocket in the right sort of direction, you can come back on yourself at an earlier time. You know, just, just for a moment, just sort of think about the kind of mind that, you know, he's working in mathematical logic and just over a conversation with Einstein comes up to speed on general relativity and thinks, ah, what about the big giant rotating disk with world lines that come back on themselves? Extraordinary, extraordinary sort of chain of thought. Why is this interesting? Well, it's actually it's very important philosophically because various arguments people have put forward to suggest that time travel is logically impossible. You often hear that said in philosophical circles. There are logical paradoxes if you have time travel. You go back and kill yourself as a baby, for instance, before you got old enough to build a time machine to do the going back and doing the killing, and you've got this paradox then, did you do the killing or did you not? so-called grandfather paradox. It usually involves slaughtering a grandfather, but you can make, it, make the circle tighter by just doing it to yourself. Auto-infanticide is the technical term in philosophy. <laughs> uh, and that's supposed to show, according to some, that time travel is logically impossible. It gives rise to a logical paradox. Well, what about Gödel's solution to the Einstein equations? He's shown that it's actually consistent with our best physical theory, consistent with general relativity, that there are closed time-like world lines. These are not just logical possibilities, these are physical possibilities. That's much stronger. So, not to say that we do live in such a universe, the claim was never that, just that it's certainly physically possible that we could live in such a universe. It's consistent with Einstein's theory, and if we did live in such a universe, there would be these trajectories. So it puts pressure on those who think that time travel is logically impossible. You still might defend that view and say what's going wrong, wrong in the Gödel uh, cases, but very, very interesting line of thought of, of, of Gödel's. And I think I might leave it there. That's a good place to finish. I really just